All right, it is April 9th, 2015. I'm here in Portage, Michigan, near Kalamazoo with Marty Stryker. Very privileged to be able to speak with Marty and have been here in this beautiful facility for a couple of hours. So we have some background information, but uh, Marty has uh, generously agreed to talk to you, uh, my students, and I think you'll like to uh, hear what Marty has to say. Again, he's chief engineer here, and I guess you've been doing this for 36 years. And I'll just ask Marty, why did you want to go into engineering? And what, um, what drew you to this business? Uh, it seemed that when I started in drafting, um, I grew in the discipline in engineering, and I continued my, in, my education in that area, and things came together to where uh, it seemed like a design engineering, mm -hmm. mechanical design engineering, was, uh, came to me very easily, and I focused on that ever since. Very good. Um, now, 36 years, you told me this facility hasn't been here that long. So have you been in the Kalamazoo area the entire 36 years? Yeah. Um, the, there was a location on Alcott Street, a small building, the original location, uh, Stryker Corporation. Then it split off into Stryker Medical and S Stryker Surgical. And from there, more things have happened within the corporation. But a uh, medical division went to another location in Kalamazoo, and then mm -hmm. finally, this location. Very good, and it's it's a beautiful facility, and I just love the atmosphere here in terms of the the, the attitude of the folks here. Um, now, the little bit of research I did, Stryker was started in 1941, but as you mentioned when we were talking earlier, it was just maybe in the last 20 years, the company has grown tremendously, and it's now, what, a $9 billion worldwide corporation? Yeah, almost $9 billion. Mm -hmm. And uh, the CEO that started in approximately 1977 uh, was a real uh, talented person and was able to grow the company uh, enormously during that time period. Was this John Brown? Yeah. And I may have mentioned to my students, if I haven't, I'll say it now, you know I'm a big fan of Jim Collins. So Jim Collins' latest book, Great by Choice, lists seven great companies that have tremendously outperformed uh, people in their market and the market as a whole, but more than that, they have a culture um, that is just a wonderful place to work and very productive. And Stryker was mentioned as one of the seven great companies in Jim Collins' last book, so congratulations to you and everyone here. And I think that's what started our conversation Thank maybe, you. Marty, last month mm -hmm. at the Jackson Inventors Network, and I'm so happy that you were willing to let me come out. So if you could give our folks just a little uh, description of what you do here, and obviously Stryker, $9 billion, does all kinds of medical devices and other uh, medical services around the world, but what specifically are you doing at this facility in Portage? At this facility, we um, are uh, self-sufficient here with our uh, development, manufacturing, and sales run out of the same location, and we manufacture, design and manufacture and sell hospital beds, hospital stretchers, ambulance, I'm sorry, ambulance cots, mm -hmm. and um, a, a number of different specialty products such as maternity beds and eye surgery stretchers. Okay, very good. And I will link this video to the short one I had where you showed me one of your inventions out in the shop, um, which was a, a stretcher which had a very innovative rail on it that you could drop down or lift up and it wouldn't hinder the patient's movement. You mentioned to me at that time, I think off video, that you have several patents. How many did you say patents that you yourself have uh, gotten? Uh, 36 issued patents and oh several gosh. more uh, pending. Okay, and I, so are those the property then of Stryker Corporation when you seek a patent? Yeah, the, we've signed agreements to where uh, en engineers and inventors within the company assign their inventions to the corporation. Okay, you know, we've talked quite a bit before I turned it on, but I actually want to talk to you about innovation if that's all right, mm -hmm. um, because what's really struck me is you are a very innovative person, and if you just can talk to students a little bit about how does the innovation process work for you? Um, well, there's a, a variety of tools that can be used so that uh, often people I work with, you know, will go into a gray conference room and say, let's brainstorm our next product. But when in reality, there's a lot of things that you can tap into to bring more insight into what is needed. Uh, looking to other industries is one. Looking uh, deeper into our customer needs is another. Just understanding uh, the medical industry is uh, great because uh, if you can bring new technologies 
to an industry that you know really is begging for those new technologies, but embrace them when they get them. Very good. All right. Uh, something that you and I have talked about, and I'll just mention to students, I've been delighted because I've only spoken with Marty a little bit prior to today and knew he was a, an excellent engineer at a very technical company. Um, so I'm thinking, well, what I've been focusing on is customer discovery because what we find is so many inventors, you know, they come up with a brilliant idea and uh, they love it and it's great to have that passion, but nobody else loves it. So they spend $15,000, get a passion, patent, patent for their passion, put it on their wall and almost frame it like something they've hunted down. But guess what? Nobody else wants to buy what they patented. Obviously that hasn't been your case, but I've just been delighted with um, the way that you approach understanding customers uh, here at Stryker. And if you could just share a little bit more about that. Actually, that's where I started. I had the same mindset of, uh, hey, I had a great idea and mm -hmm. I'm gonna just see it right on through to the end. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the right idea, but uh, in time learning that that wasn't a, a, the best way to get the best outcome. Um, now by um, learning the industry that you're in, uh, learning about the actual human beings, your customers that will make that buying decision or would be the end users of that product. Uh, real important to know, uh, observing those uh, end users, look, you know, looking at their habits, looking at what surrounds the product too, the, the other things that the product may have to interact with. So by using a number of different innovation tools, um, looking to the outside, looking to other industries, like we, we handle patients and looking at farming and material handling industries, we get a lot of ideas from, but also looking internally to the inventor inside of you who does know a lot about uh, good ideas, mm -hmm. but bringing all these th parts of the recipe together. Mm -hmm. makes a difference. When we were at lunch, um, I was just actually amazed that you actually had a packet of uh, paper and materials showing me some of the tools that you've used and you kept saying you want to have as many tools in your toolbox as you can. Now that sounds like an engineer but I am anything but an engineer and I think you're right. In terms of trying to understand what the customer wants you want to be able to come at it in different ways and I don't know if we even need to show the paper here but uh, for instance you talked about persona mapping which is something I know Menlo Innovations in Ann Arbor does brilliantly but I honestly did not expect to see it here at Stryker so would you talk a little bit about how you what it is and how you do it and, and why you do it um, coming up with a persona let's use for example a typical ICU nurse maybe a 48 year old woman uh, with uh, 25 years as being an ICU nurse who goes through things like uh, back injuries because of patient handling, sore feet because of being on their feet all day, uh, tedious record keeping, those kind of things that are painful to that uh, nurse. You know, uh, writing up, what about that nurse? What's the conditions she works in? Who is she? You know, does she have a family? What are her other responsibilities? Then by coming up with that persona, writing it down, maybe even a picture, um, then to do a experience mapping that uh, what does that nurse's day look like? You know, what does she go through during the day? Uh, wakes up in the morning, does her work, then has a family experience after work using a, a, a lot of the same muscles she had to use all day. So by uh, two, two, two different tools, the personas and the experience mapping are, are some examples of tools that we use to come up with uh, good um, product solutions. Okay, so to me, it's, it's kind of getting inside the head and the heart of the person who's gonna be using it, rather than me as the really smart designer sitting here in front of a computer, I've got this great way to design this device, but no, if I were this, I don't even remember, 45 year old ICU nurse, what would I be doing and how would I be feeling when I'm using this product or maybe even after I go home, uh, I know you mentioned that often people would be picking up patients and putting them into beds and you have devices now where they don't have to do that and how that would make their life so much better. Yeah, they have, the same nurse may have to pick up children and groceries and if she injures her back or his back then has a big impact on their personal life also. Another uh, point to bring up is in, in consumer products you'd find the person who purchases the product 
is the end user. In our industry, the person who uses the product is not the purchasing agent. Mm -hmm. They may have an influence over the, the purchase of the product, but somebody else may make the purchase of that product, further complicating that whole uh, interaction. Yeah, and, and I talk to students about you know layers of buyers, but my gosh, you've got it in a big way. You've got the patient, which uh, one of your persona maps showed a patient, and we can talk more about that if you want, which I really appreciated, a patient who was recovering from surgery and what she was feeling at many levels, which was just brilliant. But that patient is not going to be buying these devices, right? Then you've got the nurse and the other hospital workers caring for that patient. But then, as you say, then you've got people in purchasing and administration who really will be making decisions. Specifying. Yeah, yeah, and saying, okay, well, here's what we see as the cost benefit, but convincing them, well, if the, if the patient really is much happier because of it, and as you said at lunch, maybe even their, their time is shortened, so their risk of infection goes down. Obviously, the nurses are happier because there's a lot less physical stress on them, but how can you convince the person who's just basically counting dollars in the corner office? Uh, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, it, it's kind of a unique situation in this industry where nurses are really the main users of our products and nurses go into that profession being that they're very caring people mm -hmm. and those nurses may have been promoted to other administrative positions still a caring person mm -hmm. and they're the main advocate for the patient because they're a caring person mm -hmm. they want the best for the patient so that uh, knowing knowing the nurse has a big impact on all the players Okay, so do you, do you think that, and maybe this is a little bit beyond where we, we need to go, but on the sales end and marketing end, do Strikers people actually try to make contact with the nurses and really convince them of, of the merits of the, of the product? That is our main focus is the clinician because our products are made for the clinicians to do the best job for the clinicians, mm -hmm. and the cl clinicians then have influence over other uh, decision makers. Very good to know. One other thing that really amazed me in a good way when we were talking earlier was you said that you do role playing. Now this is in your engineering uh, facility which you oversee here. Um, could you talk a little bit to that? Why would you ever want to do role playing, kind of acting, and what value would that have for a bunch of engineers? Um, surprisingly, we had some really good results from role playing. Mm -hmm. Putting people into a situation where they may play out um, things that they wouldn't normally, things that you wouldn't normally come up with in a brainstorming in a conference room such as uh, one person was assigned the role of being a shy nurse and another person was assigned the role of being a loud obnoxious patient and the result was the patient wasn't getting the information she wanted from the shy nurse. Mm -hmm. Knowing that there are ways um, you know products and services that can address that issue. Okay, very good. Um, and is this something you do regularly then, the uh, the role playing? Uh, on and off. Okay, not, not regularly. all right. Um, now early on in our conversation here, you mentioned uh, in your early days as an engineer, you tended to be more, I've got this great idea, let's go with it. Uh, could you speak a little bit to what turned the tide for you? Because honestly, some people never get the tide turned. They, they're stubborn, they might be brilliant, but they're stubborn and they're, I'm gonna do it my way and I just have been unlucky and eventually I'm gonna get the hit. What actually convinced you that we need to do something a little different here to, to get it to succeed? I think uh, for myself and for the other people who may be stubborn, uh, that you really want the best final product, the most successful product that does the job intent that you intended it to do mm -hmm. and serve the end user or the customer the way in, as intended and even though you may start out with less skill in um, gathering that information that ultimately you, you want to use every means at your disposal to gain that information which will result in the best final product. Having one idea is bad because mm -hmm. If you have many ideas and you throw lots of good ones out and you end up with the best one, you're certainly going to have a better end result. Very good. And it, earlier you showed me a, a graphic, and I think maybe we can just describe it because it's a fairly simple graphic but powerful, where you kind of start with one point, 
right? And then it would almost make like a, a triangle or V issue, kind of like Ving out like this. So you start at the one point of the angle, but then you V out, and that's like one idea, then you brainstorm and it sprouts to several, but then you had an opposite V kind of coming back this way, kind of bringing it home. Would you say that's the normal process you try to engender among your engineers? Um, we've been very successful in building that into our development culture here. Uh, starting out with a concept and uh, diverge into many different ideas at, to a point, and then at that point converge on getting rid of a lot of ideas and going down into the best one. And uh, an important part of this is to leave personalities out of it. A good, a good idea is a good idea no matter where it came from. So people with trusting working relationships can come to the best idea and leave their egos behind.